so I can get your name on um, tape, to get your first and last name so I have it on tape. So if you give me your first... You want, what, my now or what I served well, under? Well, give me by now and what you and then tell me I served under. Oh, all right. My name is Catherine D. Viverberg, and I served under Catherine D. Cresto, my maiden name. C-R-E-S-T-O-L? T-O. T-O. Cresto, it's an Italian, a short Italian name, <laughs> for, fortunately. <laughs> yeah. Huh. So that should be recorded, just in case anybody would happen to know me or my brothers. I had two brothers that were in, too, so... Were, were you the oldest? No, no, I was the youngest. You were the baby? Yeah, I had two big brothers. And they went down and enlisted, and I had to go, too. I was following my brothers. Is, is... I was a tomboy. Well, you know, I was working at Lockheed then. Do you want all of this? Yeah, what, what, what were you doing at Lockheed? A small parts assembly. This uh, I went. Uh, they, they were taking on uh, women before we got before Pearl Harbor. They were started to hire women, and I heard that. So I, I went and took a, a night school course for a month. They taught us small parts assembly, and then we went out to Lockheed and they hired us. And the men <laughs> at that time they were so jealous because they got deferments, you know, for working. And there were a lot of them that that were not eager to go. In fact, they were downright cowardly. Some of them, <laughs> and they would uh, stand around the gate as we came on the night shift and just devil us and, and razz us and call us names. They just resented us taking the jobs because that put them up to be drafted, you see, and they hated that. <laughs> so that's when I started. It, it was a uh, small parts assembly, and, and it, it was neat. I liked that. I could have stayed right there. But then uh, uh, the WAC was formed in May of 42, and, oh, I wanted to go so bad. <laughs> I wanted the, you know, it was a, a big... Well, it was history in the making, and I wanted to be part of it. I wasn't content to sit there at Lockheed. I could have sat there out the war like most of them did. And my mother knew I wanted to go so bad. I think she was the bravest one of us all. She knew I wanted to go, but I was part support for her. And I had a little sister that was only 11, nobody between us. She just my baby. I always called her my first baby. <laughs> so she knew I wanted to go so bad. She hadn't worked in 30 years, and she went out to North American Aviation and got herself a job. And she came home. I'm going to cry. <laughs> I, said, I get very emotional. And she came home, and she says, you can go and enlist now, Dorothy. She says, I got a job. And she did that so that I could go. She just did that for me wow. so, so that I could be free to go. And so I went down and enlisted. <laughs> that morning I was going down, my oldest brother, John, the, the bombardier one later, he, he was uh, in the, his front bedroom there. He was still at home. The other one was married and gone. But as I went out, he was in kneeling on his bed begging me not to go. <laughs> he didn't want his sister to go to war. <laughs> he says, he says Joe, and, Joe and I'll fly the planes. You just stay here and build them. <laughs> and I, I said, nothing to it, John, I'm going to. And I just went on and enlisted. You know, and it, it was such a big adventure. Because uh, it's really, it's a horror for those who fight it, who are actually in the fighting. But for everyone who is actually up there doing the fighting, there's at least eight support troops in the rear. And they're not in much danger, you know. They don't really get get into it like that. People don't realize that a lot. They think if you're over overseas, then naturally you were in all the worst of it. But it's not that way. There were just sometimes when it was a little dangerous, like during the Battle of the Bulge, we were in Reims, and I guess we were just kind of on the edge of it. But the Germans came over every night and strafed the city. You know, and we could hear them going overhead, and we were blacked out and all like that. And, and incidents happened, but we were never in the front lines, you know. How, were, were you, uh, um, just a second, uh, were, were you a young girl at this point? Well, well, uh, well, I was young, uh, not a kid. I was, let's see, I was 20. When did I enlist? I enlisted in uh, 
January of 43, I was 22 at that time, and when I got out, I was 25. So yeah, I was young, but I wasn't a, just a kid, you know. And uh, you had to be 21 to join the wax at that time. I think they've lowered it to 18 now, but you had to be 21 then. And uh, they were newly formed. <laughs> if you've ever read Tom Brokaw's book, don't pay any attention to what he said about the wax. He got it all wrong. All wrong. I, I, I heard that he even got it, because it's the W-A-A-C? That was originally the W-A-A-C. And then it became... He, then it, they dropped, it, it was the Women's Auxiliary Army Corps. And I just started to read his book. My brother gave me his book. And I thought, well, yeah, The Greatest Generation. Well, parts of it are good. But he got the, I don't know where he got his information on the wax. Because we were the Women's Auxiliary Army Corps. And he said, in the beginning, it was the WAC, the Women's Auxiliary Corps. No way. <laughs> and, and then he goes on later on in the book. He says, Eisenhower suggested... To a WAC major general, this was after the war, he says, Eisenhower suggested to a WAC major general, and I don't think there was a WAC major general, there couldn't have been because the, the supreme commander of the WACs was a colonel. You could not have a WAC that was higher ranking than the commander, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, the, And I never heard of a major general WAC until years later. But anyway, he said, Eisenhower... Uh, told this major general, whack major general, that uh, they should drop the auxiliary and it should be the Women's Army Corps. Okay, at that point, we had been the Women's Army Corps for two years. <laughs> so I thought, I thought, where did this guy get his information? <laughs> you know, it was ridiculous. Well, I know he's gotten one letter in regards to that because we interviewed a woman named... Uh, June Jackson was her name, and she was a whack. Yeah. And she did sent, she point that out? She pointed out and got a nice letter that said, you know, thank you very much. Oh yeah. We'll take care of it in the next edition. So oh yeah, that. sure. Uh -huh. Well, I don't. I didn't finish the book. There was probably other things too, but he got it all. I'm I'm glad somebody wrote. I was going to write, and then I thought, oh, they'd never see it anyway, or they wouldn't pay any attention. He's not going to come forward and admit that he was stupid, you know. <laughs> but, but <laughs> I so don't you know. were the you were a member of the very first. Well, class. I I was yeah I joined when it was the WAAC in uh, January. I went down and enlisted January thirtieth, I think it was in forty three. See, it was still the WAAC, and and uh, the reason I know this positively, we had to re-enlist. We had to go through, in, in May of 43, they dropped the auxiliary, and it became the Women's Army Corps. Well, we were all in radio school at that time, and you had a choice. You, they would let, you could get out, or, or you could uh, re-enlist. And we had to go through the physical, the written, the interview, the whole, it was ridiculous, because we'd already been through all of that, you know. And we had to go through it all over again and re-enlist in the WAC, the Women's <laughs> Army Corps. So I, I would argue Brokaw right down to the roots, you know. <laughs> He's, but uh, then, so we re-enlisted, and this was in, in uh, May of 43, when they, then they changed it, and a little while after that, I forget the exact date, but we had to go through the whole thing again. <laughs> So when when you enlisted, what did you, because stereotypically a lot of people when we talk about World War II, they say, oh, well, women nurses. Oh, the nurses were not whack. I know. No, they were, people get that wrong too. I've had people say, say that. Oh, uh, the nurse, the nurse corps was its own corps. But I mean, a lot of people think that that's all that women did in World War II. I know. So we and need to straighten them out. Well, please straighten them out. I'm not doing this for myself. I want the wax to get some recognition at last. Late though it is, <laughs> they deserve it. Because, well, I, whenever, all through these years, it's been, what, 56, 7 years. And all these years, whenever I've re read anything mentioning the women in World War II, it's always the ferry pilots and the nurses, and the wax get nothing. 
And I say, well, fine. They did their job. They were fine. I wouldn't take away from them. But we were there too, <laughs> you know. And we were up a, a lot closer to the front. Well, the ferry pilots just flew the planes over. They didn't have anybody to fight with. <laughs> Nobody was dropping bombs on them. You know, the, the nurses, yes, they would be closer to the front even than we were. But you know, they deserve their praise, but we do too. So when you signed up, what choices, did you have choices? No, of? you didn't have, but I had four things I wanted. I wanted to go, I had basic training in Daytona Beach, Florida, because that sounded much better than Sioux Falls, South Dakota. <laughs> I don't want to insult South Dakota, but Florida sounded like more fun. <laughs> and that was a, the first WAC training center was in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Then they opened a second one as it grew, you know, in Florida. And so I wanted to have basic training in Florida. I'd never been down there and it sounded good. And uh, then I wanted uh, radio. I don't know why I wanted radio. I was never interested in it before, <laughs> and I can't remember, but I thought that would be a, a good, a fun thing, you know. I wanted to be a radio operator, and I wanted to go overseas. And what was the fourth thing? Ah, I forgot the fourth thing. There were four things. Anyway, I got them all. <laughs> I just lucked <laughs> out. I got everything I wanted. <laughs> and and uh, I got through radio school, and... Uh, Oh, oh, I had a letter in that batch that he's got there that my brother wrote me from, uh, he, he flew the hump, you know, the, he's one of the now legendary hump pilots. That was the toughest route in the world for the pilot, the planes of that day. And they lost over 900 planes and crews on that route during the war. It was from, from uh, India to China, a supply route, you remember that? And uh, he got a letter from him, and he was teasing me. He said, he said, we were in a ground station, you know, and you had contact with the pilots. You'd give them weather reports and things like that. And, and he, 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 was, he said, you know, uh, you get a lot of cussing for the ground stations. <laughs> he was teasing me. And he says, uh, but once in a while somebody says something nice, so don't feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> so how long did you... Um... How long did you train? Uh, uh, uh. Uh, one month in basic training, and then we went uh, to our uh, you know, uh, schools, whatever school you were going to, if you went. If uh, you were doing office work, of course, you had done that. That didn't take training, but something like radio, you'd have to. That was a five-month course. We went to Kansas City, Missouri. Oh, that was fun. We were housed in hotels there. <laughs> Not one to a room, but, <laughs> but we had a, we were, I think we were eight to a room with double-deck GI bunks, but we had a, a bath for just those, you know. And uh, we, we thought that was pretty good, right, in the heart of, of Kansas City, Missouri. And it got better. And we found out right next door was another hotel full of GIs. <laughs> Maybe that was the fourth thing you wanted. Oh, right. No, no, no. We had plenty of those. But, you know, on all the bases, they had civilian workers. And, oh, those women hated that. They were so jealous because they had to leave the base. They got off work, you know, worked in the offices. They got off at 5 o'clock, so they had to leave the base. And there we were all evening. <laughs> So we had the advantage of him, but that stuff like that, it was fun. Um, was was the military ready for women? Oh, or did they, or the was guys. This... Oh, the guys were were very receptive. I mean, they were nice to us. They, they were, oh, they would kid us, you know. One, one time we were, where was that base? That was up in Wisconsin, and we were marching in formation somewhere. And here came a bunch of the guys in formation towards us. And when they saw us, they all started to sing, "The waxen waves will win the war, parley vu," you know, the parley vu thing. And they went through all that and they said, "The waxen waves will win the war." So what the hell are we marching for? <laughs> and we started right in as soon as they got that. Just as though we'd rehearsed it, we said, the soldiers thought they won the war, parley vu, et cetera, et cetera. The soldiers thought they won the war, but the wax got there the day before. <laughs> that sort of thing went on all the time. And there, there was one song, I won't repeat, it was one of the nasty ones. Every time the squad was coming past our barracks, 
they'd start singing that song, <laughs> you know, just guy like, but stuff like that. But oh, we got along. We we dated them, and they, you know, they they didn't resent us at all. Oh, maybe some of them did, but no, not usually. It was the women that resented us because we were right there with their men. <laughs> they didn't like that. No, we we got along fine. Now, did and, you did you choose to enlist because of a, a patriotic? Oh, partly, partly, yes. My country was at war, just like my brothers did, and they felt it was their duty to go. They they didn't wait to be drafted. They went down. Both of them went down together, enlisted in the Army Air Corps, and uh, yeah, there was patriotism there. But the, I wouldn't say that was the only thing. It was also, it was history being made. A big world war. How could you sit it out? You know? Well, had you, had you been there, would you have sat it out? You're, I, you're I too young so. to have been yeah, there. Yeah, I'm too young. But uh, think about that. Your country's at war. If you were young and single, oh, there were married men with children. No, you wouldn't. they couldn't leave their families to starve, you know. There were a lot of them that worked in the defense plants. Those weren't the cowardly ones. But some of the young ones were. They, they would come up for deferment. And they would just absolutely get sick. They were so afraid, really. And you had you had to despise those kind. They they were not anything. <laughs> my my brother Johnny had already enlisted in August of forty two, and then they waited to be called. They waited. They didn't get called. We were all called up the same week in February, mind you. Well, while he was waiting to be called up after he was already enlisted, he thought, well, he might as well go work at Lockheed and, and do some good while he was waiting. So he lasted a month and he quit. He says, I can't stand to work with those cowards out there. Because they, they were like that, you know. Some, a lot of them were. They actually were cowards. And you can't... Uh, I think Brokaw kind of gave the defense workers uh, praise for being so patriotic. They didn't go to work there to be patriotic. We, I went from a $16 a week job in a shoe store when Lockheed started to open up for women to a $42, now it doesn't sound like much these days, but that was money back there, to $42. You think I went from patriotism? No, <laughs> the pay was better. What people don't stop to realize, we had just been through a depression. You know, the 30s was terrible, were terrible for a lot of people. My dad managed to work through it, but, but a lot of people actually went hungry. It was tough. And if you could finally get a job, and this was early, it was 19, well, before we got it, before Pearl Harbor it was, in the 40s, 41, they started hiring. And uh, people didn't go there out of patriotism, not at that point. We weren't even at war at that point. But they, they get a lot of credit for that. They say they were patriots. No, they weren't. Somebody like my mother was. She went to work so that I could go in the Army because she knew I wanted it. <laughs> she was funny. And the, the day the war ended in, in Europe, she quit right then. She worked in the tool crib at North America. <laughs> she told me, she quit, it was about noon. She just quit right then, laid, took off her apron. Later she says, I'm through, the war's over, I'm going home. <laughs> and she sat in, the, in the, uh, the restaurant, you know, they had there, and waited for her ride to take her home all day. <laughs> she just quit. <laughs> she, she was quite a character. But she, she was so dear, she did all that just so I could go. Huh. Now that was, she was the best patriot of us all, I guess. But the boys went down and enlisted. Uh, one, the uh, youngest one was married already, but he didn't have any children, so he figured he should go too. And he stayed in, or he got in again after, uh, when they formed the Air Force. You know, it was the Army Air Corps during the war. And then in, I think, 47, they activated the U.S. Air Force. Well, he was getting out. He got back from the hump in 46, and he had to get out then. So he waited a year till they activated the Air Force. Then he applied for a He was a pilot. Then he commanded, applied for a commission and got it. And so then he served 30 years. 
Wow. And he, he flew B-52s when they were new. <laughs> he ultimately commanded a B-52 squadron, and he came out a bird colonel. That was pretty good for a kid with a high school education. That, Nowadays, you have to have college. That was the interesting thing about the, um, about the war was the fact that a lot of people uh, uh, that might not have um, uh, had... Even a high school education. Yeah. I mean, some of them went in. Yeah, you could. They didn't have it. Later, they raised it. You have to, now you have to have a college degree to be an officer. Uh, and now you do, but at that time, it, and he barely got through high school. <laughs> now he, he wasn't dumb. He was just one of these kids that fooled around. He was always pulling little gags in school, and, and he, he would just study enough to pass. He never failed, of course, but he, he'd make like C's or even a D once in a while. He just didn't care. He wasn't a student. <laughs> but boy, when he got to fly, that was the dream of his life. You know, in the, in the 20s, when we were growing up in the 20s, planes were just new. And where we lived on the outskirts of Los Angeles it was all open fields clear across. And there were six little airports in a row over there, the little tiny planes. If you've, you've seen pictures of the early planes, and that's what they flew. And, oh, he was always dragging us over, to <laughs> us kids over to the airport. And he'd see a plane fly. I can still see him. He's about nine years old standing in the backyard and just watching a plane go over with his dreams in his eyes. And he says, someday I'm going to be an aviator. It was his dream. And then when they went down to enlist, by that time they were sorting them out. At first they trained them all as pilots, and then if they didn't have what it took to be a pilot. They used to say, a pilot is born, you can make a navigator or bombardier. Well, you know, a pilot has to have, oh, oh the reaction time and then all kinds of things that you can't teach them. They have to be born with it. So they both went down. John wanted to fly, too, the older one. But somehow he didn't have what it took. They made him a bombardier. They sorted him out at that time. Well, they found out it was a waste to train them all as pilots and then, then take the ones that didn't make it and train them again as bombardiers and navigators. So they got smart after a while, and they sorted them out first. I don't know what tests they took, but whatever. But Joe made it for pilot, and I thought if, if one of them had to not make it, it was John that shouldn't have, because it wasn't his dream. So Joe was the... So the, Joe was the, the one. He was the dreamer, the one that he really He was the dreamer to, that uh, had to fly, and then he did. He spent 30 years in the, in the Air Force and retired a bird colonel. With now, now, you ended up being a radio operator, is that right? Yeah, in a ground station. Except for the one time in Florida that I was telling him about when we got to fly. Well, it was a B-17 uh, transition base, they called it, and uh, the girls did not fly in those days. And nowadays they would. They'd do everything the boys do. But in those days, we were treated like ladies. We really were. We got the best quarters. And when we, we sailed on the Queen Elizabeth, we got the, the best quarters in first class. Well, not, you know, many of us in a cabin, but the guys were sleeping downstairs on the decks <laughs> as it was a troop ship then. But in Florida that time, uh, Hendricks Field was at Sebring, Florida, right in the, about the center of Florida. It was, it was a B-17 base where they trained pilots to fly the big bombers. So every time they went on a training flight, they had to have a full crew. They had to have a radio operator. And the only radio operators on the base were all girls. <laughs> so we got to fly, and we were told it was the only base in the States where the girls got to fly. So you see, I got the brakes all along. I, I remember flying over Miami one time as a crew member of a B-17, mind you, and that was a, a big thing. And I just remember the lights of Miami all spread out underneath. It was a magnificent sight, you know. Just was I, I just got that kind of a break all the way, and then when I when I got to England, oh, we arrived at the the Eighth Air Force replace, replacement depot in Stone, England, uh, on orders that were nine months old, and all the jobs had been filled, and that poor captain, the WAC captain, had five hundred WACs with no jobs on her hands, and she was going crazy. I felt sorry for that poor woman. She was, she had to hunt all over England for all the bases, and she started sending us out one or two at a time, wherever she could find an opening. 
And my secondary classification was clerk typist, which I hated office work. Oh, that was, you know, she finally sent me out all by myself. But again, I lucked out. I got to this uh, headquarters of 9th Bombardment Division, 9th Air Force. Uh, it was up by Colchester. And when I got there, the guy that interviewed me, the officer that was interviewing me, he said, uh, well, I see you're a radio operator. He says, wouldn't you rather be doing that? I said, oh, yeah, I almost hugged him. <laughs> oh, yes, sir, I certainly would. So he put me back in radio. I, I just got that kind of luck all the way. And because I landed there, I got to go to France and, and Belgium because we kept moving up. See, the medium bombers that I was telling the, the other guy, uh, the Eighth Air Force were the heavies, the B-17s, B-24s, four-engine bombers, and they could fly clear to Germany and back again. But the, we had the, what were they, B-25s and something else, the twin engine, and they didn't have the, the distance, see? So as the front moved through France, we had to move too. So we, we went to France, and we landed on Omaha Beach, the most famous beach in the world, <laughs> but not on D-Day, of course. We were in September. And that was funny. We landed on Omaha Beach on September 10th, and exactly one year later, September 10th, I sailed into New York Harbor on the Queen Mary, and everything was over. Exactly on the same day. It was funny. Boy, that was a day. So, so when you landed on Omaha Beach, and you were... Well, it was three months after D-Day, but, but we still, all landed on Omaha Beach. It was probably the most famous beach in the world. And well, and that was, I mean, that's where, when you talk about history... Uh, yes, that history was made right there. And yeah, as I say, uh, I had to be part of history. I didn't know I was going to land on Omaha Beach, but but we did. And then we, we went, uh, we were stationed at Chartres. And then uh, that, that had been, they told us, just two weeks before we got there, it had been a Luftwaffe base, the German Air Force base, and they had moved out just two weeks before we got there, they told us. And so we were just pushing, because we had, our planes had to move up in order to function. So what was your, your radio equipment? Was that in a truck, or how did you move your well, radio? Well, it was just uh, radio, you know, earphones like you got, and da-da-da-da. We had the little, you've seen that in movies if you haven't seen it anywhere else, with the little key that we sent on, Morse code was. We, everything was coded. We never got a message in the clear. It was all coded. And we had contact with the, oh, one of our nets was uh, 8th Air Force, and... and uh, Oh, d different uh, oh, squadrons around that were, you know, I forget how many, five or six you had. Each operator had about five or six. You sent and received messages, and then those messages being in code, about every half hour they gathered them up and took them over to what they called the message center where they were decoded, but we never saw that. It was all code. So but were you having to, did you... Uh Handwrite the messages. Yeah, you'd he... handwrite with with, and then you'd send back with your. I can I can remember some of the code now, but some letters I kind of say, was that right? Like an A with da da, a B with da did da did, C with da 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 did, D da did it like that. I can remember most of them still, but I haven't used it, you know, for years. So but did... I loved it. It was a it was a good job. It was interesting. Did, did somebody come over your shoulder and dictate a message to you, or did you have No, a no, they'd give us a message to, to send, but it was in code. It, you couldn't tell what it was, you know. We weren't, we weren't uh, well, we didn't need to know. You just sent the letters, that's all. <laughs> but it was real neat, and, and it, the gang was always, there was always, oh, maybe just five or six of us there, and we all knew each other, and we got along, and in between working, you know, you'd kid around, and it, it was really a nice job, it was interesting, and we worked shifts, we'd only work, because you can't pick up those signals, after about six hours, your ears get kind of dead. You can't pick them up good. So our shifts were only six hours, and then we had 12 hours off. So we, we got a nice break. Like if you'd work from noon till 6 p.m., then you wouldn't be on again till the next day at 6 p.m. 
you'd work from six to midnight, then you wouldn't be on till the next midnight. So we had a lot of time to, to play and see the sights and have fun. It was a really good job. And it was a nice bunch to work with always, you know. And then, uh, oh, it got a little hairy sometimes when we were in Reims. It was during the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, our radio room was outside the main gate. It was in a building just outside. So in order to run the messages, we had to go through that gate. We had to go outside and through the gate. And one time, uh, there were snipers shooting at the guards. One of our guards on the gate got shot. I didn't think he was just wounded. But uh, during the Battle of the Bulge, the, there were uh, French collaborators that would do things like that. And outside, our, our there was a little alley that ran by the, our bedrooms out there. And one night we heard the rattle of a machine gun out there, <laughs> and and next day they, you know, we asked what was that all about. And they said, oh, they caught a collaborator out there sending flares up to show the Germans where our headquarters was, and they they caught him and just naturally mowed him down. <laughs> and uh, the guys, uh, they had what they called tent city. I never saw that. It was was on the outside. See, we were. The headquarters was in a, it had been a school, a private girls' school, so it was nice. And there was a courtyard in the front and buildings all around, quite a large school. But the girls were quartered there, but the guys were, were we were never quartered near each other, they were always separated. Nowadays they don't do it that way, but they should. <laughs> that, that, you know, it's stupid not to, uh, it just causes trouble. My, my daughter was in the Air Force and she told me, and my, and my daughter-in-law was too, but anyway, that's the way it was then. They had, they called it Tent City and they lived in tents outside. As I say, I never saw it. We had no occasion to go out there. But they were very vulnerable to the planes coming over just in the tents. And they, I don't know what, they, they must have had bomb shelters as they did. Where we were in England, they had bomb shelters. And when there was an air raid, we were supposed to run to the bomb shelters. What we did was run outside <laughs> and watch the buzz bombs. The buzz bombs were coming over. Remember the buzz bombs? They were coming over, and they were scary. They were little things that were shaped like a bomb, like with little fire tails streaming out behind them. And they would come over. We'd run out and watch them. And uh, they never landed right on us, fortunately. <laughs> we weren't supposed to do that. We were supposed to go to the bomb shelter. But one, one time, uh, you, if you were receiving a message, you were supposed to stop in the middle of it, and you sent uh, what they called a cue signal that tell, told him it was an air raid. So I sent the cue signal, and the guy sent back in the clear, run! <laughs> You weren't supposed to send anything in the clear, but whoever on the other end, he sent back a run. <laughs> but we ran outside and watched him go over. After we left there, we heard that one of those landed on our main gate. So they, they weren't aimed at us. We were about 60 miles north, north, northeast, I guess. I lose directions over there. Anyway, up closer to the channel by Colchester from London. They were aimed at London. But they couldn't aim those. They weren't delivered by plane. They were sent, you know, the buzz bombs. Yeah, and so they couldn't aim them that good. So we'd get the fallout up there. <laughs> but usually, oh, two or three a night would wander up there, <laughs> enough to keep us active, you know. But so then, that was a that was a, an airstrip that you were at where you were stationed. Well, it, it was Ninth Bombardment Division. Yeah, they had an airstrip, Ninth uh, Air Force, Ninth Bombardment Division headquarters, though. It was, uh, we weren't an active uh, air base exactly, but there was an airstrip there. I, I think I was telling him that plane that landed, maybe you heard me. There was a, a, a real beat up plane that just barely made it across the channel and landed on our airstrip. Now we were not an active air base is what I'm saying, but they had an airstrip there, I guess, for the big shots to come in and out, you know, like that. So this plane, it was a B-17, that was just shot to hell from nose to tail. I don't know how it got across the channel. And they carried off three dead gunners from that plane. And boy, that, that really brought the war home to us, you know. And we, we were just, we went to see the plane and, we, and they were carrying off the ball turret gunner, the tail gunner, and the nose gunner were all dead. And the guys carried them off. And I don't know how the pilot got that, that plane home. 
you know, it, it was uh, every once in a while. And when we came up, we landed on Omaha Beach. And as we were going up, <laughs> the guys, again, the guys had to march. We had to go two miles to meet the planes that were picking us up to take us to Chartres, where we were going. So the guys had to march those two miles. They brought trucks down for us to ride in. <laughs> That's the way they treated us. Nowadays, they'd have the girls marching too. <laughs> and I don't go for that. <laughs> but anyway, as, as we were going along in the trucks, we were all excited. We were looking around, you know, here we are in France. And we were all excited. All of a sudden, dead silence just as though the sound had been cut off, we had all, I guess we had all looked to the left at the same time, and over there were those rows of white crosses. You've, you've seen that scene. They often show that, the cliffs, there were high cliffs, and then the, the, the cemetery was right there, and they buried the, a lot of them that, that died on Omaha Beach, and oh, we just sobered up right then. It was just the most awesome heartbreaking sight as we realized we had just crossed the beach where those boys had fallen and it just sobered us all up right there. Nobody said a word the rest of the way. It was just one of those dramatic moments. But there's rows and rows of white crosses out in that cemetery. I've seen pictures of it since. They always show that because it's right above Omaha Beach and it, it's a historic spot. But that was very, there were, you know, things like that. And, uh, but we were not, uh, well, we were headquarters, and headquarters of, of uh, Bombardment Division is not like, I guess an infantry headquarters would be right up front along with them. But when you're flying, the planes were not. And that was one advantage the, the Air Corps had because uh, the infantry is always right up there. They have no relief. You know, they're in the trenches. They have no relief. But uh, the bombers would go over, and of course that was hell. They'd get shot down. They'd get wounded, you know, like that. But when they got back to base, then they were they could relax and, and rest uh, overnight. They weren't under fire then. They got back to England. So I always thought they, they really had it a little better, although the, the mission would, would be terrible, you know, that, that could be really like that plane that came in with the three dead gunners. <coughs> they often had. And then my brother went missing in action, the, the bombardier, and uh, I got the story on that, but first I just heard that he'd gone down over Germany. We were in Reims then, and it was just uh, just before the Battle of the Bulge started. That was in December, just before Christmas. And he went down the end of November, and nobody knew whether he was dead or alive for a while. That was, that was a terrible time. But then, then his name came through on a prisoner of war list, and uh, he, he was one of the lucky ones, too. You know, a lot of them, the, the pilots would bail out. Well, John told me this when he got back after the war, so I know it was authentic. It wasn't just gossip. But uh, the civilian, the, they'd see the pilots coming down, you know. You could see, well, not just pilots, the crew. If they had to bail out, they'd come down in Germany. The civilians would uh, try to capture them, and they'd beat them to death. They would actually kill them and beat them to death. And uh, if the infantry caught them, they didn't, they didn't go that far, but they kind of were abusive. They let them go hungry, and they, didn't, they were kind of mean to them, but they didn't actually kill them. So the Luftwaffe, there always seems to be a, a, a kind of a brotherly feeling between the Air Corps. If you remember in World War I, we used to read stories about how the aces, would, they'd challenge each other, and if one of them went down, uh, the other, the one would fly over his base and drop a wreath. Have you read that? I used to read those. And there was kind of an honor among them. So the Luftwaffe would see a, an airman coming down, and they'd rush to get to him before either the infantry or the civilians could get him. They'd rescue them from their own people. Imagine that. And they did, and that's what happened to John. He jumped with, with three other guys, and the three of them landed together. One of them uh, broke his leg, and John and the other guy were trying, carrying him, trying to find help somewhere when the Luftwaffe found him. 
and the other one drifted away and was never heard from again. And they figured the civilians had probably caught him. So John was just lucky all the way. And then he was sent up to a Luftwaffe base uh, up on the Baltic, uh, where he said they, they didn't uh, mistreat him, but they, they just, uh, uh, they didn't have any food, but the guards didn't have any either. They even shared their food with the prisoners. So all they did was go hungry. But uh, you probably read at the end of the war, the Germans were so terrible, they would march the prisoners back so that they couldn't be rescued. And they called those death marches because they kept them marching. As the Allies approached, they would march them. Instead of just leaving them there and letting them be freed, they'd march them and, and a lot of them would die along the way because you know, they weren't in good health anyway. They hadn't had much to eat, and, and they called those the death marches. So John was just lucky all the way like that. Uh, he got back all right when the war ended. The Russians overran that camp and saved him, and he said the first thing they did, they came bringing uh, beef herds with them. The first thing they did was slaughter the beef and feed everybody. So they're not as bad as they were, they were painted. <laughs> John was always grateful. He said they rescued us and they fed us, fed him right away, and immediately sent to the nearest American headquarters to tell him that they, they freed. Now I've had people tell me, oh, the Russians were terrible. They when the, when they captured a, a like that a, a prison, a German prison, they wouldn't tell the Americans. I've had people tell me that, and that's nonsense. Why would they do that? The war was ending. They didn't want a bunch of American prisoners on their hands. Gee, that didn't make any sense at all. But I've had several people tell me that over the years, and they tell it, they believe it. Somebody told them, it, and that's nonsense. Anyway, John, they were freed right away, so, so he was lucky. By that time, he had a little baby girl he had never seen at home. When he went down, he had a little baby girl that was two months old. And I thought, oh, that poor man, how he must have suffered there. And not knowing what would happen to him or if he'd ever get back, you know. But he was lucky, he did. And, and, and you had, while you were over there, you had heard that your brother had been captured. The, the, what? While you were over in Europe, you heard, you got the news that your brother had been captured? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I got a letter from my mother. They had notified her. He was missing in action. He was carried as missing in action for about oh, two or three months before word came through that his, his name was on a prisoner's list. The Germans used to, they'd, I guess they'd exchange lists with the Allies for the prisoners, because the Allies took prisoners too, and uh, they would send a list of, of the prisoner, and his name showed up on a, a list. I got two sweet letters from from two of his crew members wrote to me and very encouraging letters, you know, and they were telling me, uh, oh, we know Johnny will be all right, and, uh, you know, and finally the word came. Well, my, my CO had friends in, in the 8th Air Force in England, and she went, and she, I went to her and told her, and, and she checked up, and she finally got the word from 8th Air Force. So then he, well, he was a prisoner, but at least he was alive and safe, and then the war ended and he got back. Huh. But I've, I met him, I started to tell you, I met him when we got to the 8th Air Force Replacement Depot in Stone, and uh, all the way, we, we had been stationed in, in Florida about 10 miles apart, and we both got overseas orders the same week. Well, they don't tell you where you're going, we didn't know if we were going to Pacific or, or to Europe, either one of us. So he had already left by the time I stopped by to say goodbye to him. So I went on, I had to leave, and anyway, uh, I have I've got to New York. We sailed on the Queen Elizabeth, which was a troop ship, and I didn't know all the way, there were a lot of crews flight crews on the ship too. And oh, I kept looking and looking and looking. It's like, well, maybe John's on the same ship. And then I'd think, yeah, he probably went to the Pacific, you know. <laughs> but I kept looking for him all the way. It, and it turned out we landed in, in Stone, England. It was the 8th Air Force Replacement Depot. We landed there the same day. 
And we didn't know, we didn't know it, but th that turned up. Uh, he had gone, uh, uh, they had sent him up to I think it was Newfoundland or, or uh, Labrador, somewhere like that, and they had been weathered in for two weeks, and then they flew over. So we arrived at the same time, not knowing it, and I'm still looking for him because I know there's crews all over. And one day we were marching back from a gas drill we'd been to, and here came John down the sidewalk, and I, for the life of me, I could not march past him. I leaped out in front of him. I happened to be on that side of the ranks, and I just leaped out in front of him, and I said, John! And he stood there. He couldn't even get my name out. He was walking with another guy. And then, oh, I didn't dare stay. I was out of formation. You don't do that. I thought, oh boy, I'm going to catch hell when I get back. But I couldn't have passed him by. So we made a date to to meet that night. And I got back to the, the to my, uh, uh, you know, uh, barracks. And I had to go in to see the captain, of course, right away. And she was ready to ball the devil out of me. But I said, I said oh ma'am, that was my very own brother. And I just couldn't go past <laughs> and she calmed down then. She said, she just said, well, don't do it again. <laughs> but she didn't punish me. She let me go. And they were all looking for, all the girls were thrilled as they were looking for brothers, even husbands, fiancés, you know, everybody. And, and I was the first one that found one. So they were all excited about it. Wow. <laughs> and that night, oh, this, this was funny. You were not allowed at that time, I don't know what the rule is now, uh, enlisted women could not fraternize with officers. You just didn't, well, they did, but they weren't supposed to. I never did, I, and I never met one I wanted to. But anyway, so uh, John and I were standing there, of course in uniform, you know. We were just standing outside a building talking that evening, and, uh, well, being a... Uh, Bombardier, he, he was a uh, the second lieutenant just, but he was an officer. And this major comes by, he sees us standing there, and he came stalking up to us, mad, he was just mad. And he said, of course, they don't, they ignore the lesser rank. They'll speak, if, if you're in a group, they'll speak to the highest rank and ignore the rest. So he was talking to John, and he starts bawling the devil out of him for being, he says, you, you know better, you don't belong with an enlisted one. He's going on, John's standing there rigid at attention in the major. <laughs> and he, he just lets him rant on, and he couldn't interrupt him, you know. And finally the guy stops for breath, and John says, sir, this is my sister. And that major just, he turned beat red, and he, he was so embarrassed, he said, sorry, and spun on his heel and stalked off. And we stood there waiting till he got out of earshot, and we broke out down laughing, it was funny. <laughs> that poor major, well, he shouldn't have just assumed, you know, he should have found out who we were. But you don't expect to see a brother and sister in the middle of a war like that. <laughs> But that was that was funny. There were a lot of incidents like that, but it was a big adventure, you know. It was, it was a, a war as hell. People suffer through it, and I've read all the stories too. But what I'm saying is, if you're a support in the support troops, you're behind the lines. You're not in that kind of hell. And I think it's the infantry that gets the worst of it. Those those you know, and the tank corps and all those. I always thought tanks were awful. You're just trapped in that tank, you know? And that's not protection if it hit, gets a direct hit. <laughs> you might think, well, yeah, it's good protection around you, but no, you're trapped in it. But, well, well, Patton was one of our heroes. We thought he was great. You know, he was very dramatic. He was always getting in trouble, too, with his superiors. <laughs> but what, what was it? Maybe you remember. I can't remember the uh, Bastogne. When the what do what was that on the group, bridge? Oh, what group was was surrounded at Bastogne, and they fought and fought and fought, for, held out for days. You remember that? And they called them the battling bastards of Bastogne. Do you, I, can't, I, I? And I'm trying because a gentleman just told me this story yesterday about it. And, and yeah, Patton was. And Patton well, rescued him. Hundred and first. Hundred and first. Oh, the hundred and first airborne. 
Good girl. I didn't know you were over there. <laughs> oh, Michael. <laughs> There's a, if I'd known you were there, I'd be more self-conscious. We're not here. <laughs> That's my daughter and my bonus son. <laughs> uh, yeah, I couldn't think who, who was there. At the hundred and first, and they were trapped there, and they fought, just fought like the devil. And and Patton, he came uh, clear across France with his tanks, and and finally relieved the siege. Yeah, I just thought of that. I just remembered that what they called him. <laughs> and, no, we visited later on. We visited the eighty second Airborne, and uh, oh, that that was funny. They had a dance for us. Uh, they were they were back on, on a. Well, what they call an R and R rest and relaxation. They were back. They had been, they had made by that time. I think it was five jumps, and the company that we we were went to visit them. We were in Reims then, and they were a little ways outside, a ways out. And we went to visit them one time. Uh, a bunch of us in the truck. It was an official visit. <laughs> we weren't just wandering out there. <laughs> and they were so nice. They were so glad to see it. Those guys and uh, uh, a couple of the officers, they kidnapped <laughs> sort of <laughs> me and, and my buddy and took us to, to their uh, orderly room. And they were trying to get, they had all kinds of stuff. They were giving us everything, you know, all soap and stuff. And, and then the, they wanted to give us their boots. <laughs> their jump boots and this one guy they had made well it was a, a whole company was I don't know how many a hundred and some would be in a company uh, it was 122 in our company but I don't know what there was but but there were only three left of the original company after they had made I think it was five jumps only three of them left they had terrible casualties in, in the, the paratroopers and uh, just just those three, and, and all the young guys, you know, it just, uh, it was things like that that really brought the war home to you. But, but they were they were so neat. They wanted to give us everything they had. And this one lieutenant, he was one of the original ones too, and he wanted to give me his jump boots, but uh, he he said he said well he said they were. Well, he went and got he got, went and got some new. He said they were too big. For me, and he went and got some smaller ones, and insisted on giving me those jump boots. <laughs> they were funny, but they. Uh, did did Jeff, have you seen the movie The Longest Day? You remember that? Remember the character John Wayne played? He was a colonel of the 82nd Airborne. I watched that movie several times till one day it dawned on me I danced with that colonel, <laughs> the character that he played. Because they invited us to a dance, you know. Oh, wax were American girls, and then they were, you know, they were always. We always got that the American girls, <laughs> and uh, they were. Those guys were so nice. But I actually danced with that colonel. It didn't dawn on me after I, until I. The last time I saw the movie, I guess I have it on my VCR, and I thought, Hey, wait a minute! That was the colonel of the 82nd. Yeah. <laughs> How many? Um... Were you just a small band of wax? Cause you well, were... Uh, the com we were a company, 122 of us. That oh, okay, so the whole company traveled together. The company together traveled, yeah. Yeah, uh, we got sent out. I was telling you, when we got to England, uh, we didn't arrive as a company. There were 500 of us. We just had overseas orders and were shipped out. Well, like the guys, I, I guess sometimes they traveled as companies. I don't know. We didn't travel that way. We left a company and joined another one at the other end of wherever we were going, if you were transferred. So we were. there was a bunch of us being sent overseas. Uh, at the time, but not as a company. There was, oh, six or eight of us left the base. What they would do, uh, they would send orders to the CO, but not by name, was by classification number. And then she would pick who she wanted to get rid of. <laughs> Literally, she did. There was one girl there. Well, she was a young CO, unmarried, and uh, she had a thing for the lifeguard. She was good dating the lifeguard. We had a pool. <laughs> and this girl, Anita, oh, she was a beauty. She had been a model in New York, and so she was making a play for, for this lifeguard and we all got the biggest kick out of this Anita was I forget what her oh she was a, a driver a driver and she was on leave in back in New York when these orders came through 
Well, they wanted two drivers and I think it was four radio operators and like that, but, the, but not by name, it was just by, uh, and darned if that captain didn't send for Anita all the way from New York. <laughs> she saw her chance to <laughs> ship her out. We got the biggest kick out of that. <laughs> she, she couldn't stand the competition. <laughs> So what, what, I don't know how heavy that was, but Anita was making eyes at him, you know, and, <laughs> and she was really a beautiful girl. She had, I don't know, whatever possessed her to go and join the WAC. She was a New York model. <laughs> so what other types of jobs did the WAC have? Because you talked about radio operator. Well, we're radio operator, uh, teletype operators, uh, any jobs uh, like that, all, all kinds of office work. Uh, I don't think we had any weather forecasters in those days. They they have later. I know a girl that was a weather forecaster in later years. But uh, well, just uh, regular often drivers. They sometimes they they could drive trucks and sometimes they just would drive. Officers always had their own driver, a, a high ranking, you know, like that. And oh, any kind of an office job. Now, did they give you a, a special uniform, or did you get just the regular? Oh, no, uh, well, we wore just a whack uniform. You didn't have a special, you mean for the job that you did? Well, men versus women. Oh, so they we, did have a whack uniform. Oh, yes. And what ha was haven't the, you ever seen pictures of whacks? I may mean, yeah, have, but what, what was the... Well, we wore skirts. You didn't wear pants in those days. Skirts and a jacket and, and shirts and tie. And oh, clodhopper shoes. We, we hated those shoes. <laughs> Brown Oxfords, just about as ugly as you could imagine. <laughs> Finally, in the when we were overseas, uh, it was about the last year of the war. Uh, they allowed us for for dress wear. We could wear a high heel, just a plain brown pump. But oh, that was so much nicer than those. And they issued dresses at the uh, for not not for formal wear. If you were on duty, you couldn't wear them. But uh, they were sort of a, I don't know, sort of a grayish beige. But uh, they weren't too bad. The color wasn't too good. But <laughs> but they fit pretty well if you had any kind of a figure, you know. So you're um, so, and then my daughter, my sister-in-law, sent me a pair of, of high heels to wear with that. So, boy, I felt all dressed up by that time. <laughs> but ordinarily, no, it was just uniforms. And then we had fatigues like the guys have, you know, the model for the green, and you've seen those. We had those. And then they were pants. Oh, so so some but, of the time you were traipsing across Europe, you at least got to wear pants rather than having to wear a skirt. No, we didn't wear the fatigues off base. That was only if you were doing some work job. You, you, if you were, uh, you know, if you were, uh, you couldn't wear them around casually. You Like going to the, the NCO club in the evening, no. You'd have to be in your, your garment, your dress, until they issued those dresses, and then you could wear those if you were on a date like. But, but mostly, no, the, the fatigues were just if you were on a work detail. You, you couldn't just run around in them. <laughs> huh. But, uh, yeah, those, uh, oh, the, we thought those whack uniforms were pretty ugly. But when we got overseas, do you remember what they called the Eisenhower jacket? He wore a short, short jacket. Well, anyway, it was known as the Eisenhower jacket. Uh, they issued those to the wax overseas. And we were very proud of those. The ones back home didn't get them. <laughs> Just us. <laughs> oh, well, there was almost a riot when we came home to be discharged. Oh, we were going home. We sewed everything on our, the, all, everything we had on those jackets, you know, uh, all our patches and everything from overseas. And uh, when we got to our base, in, they'd send you to the nearest. They had uh, several, oh, about six bases around the country where they'd send you to be discharged. So I went to Camp Beale in California, it was up by Sacramento, and we got there, and damned if they didn't take those uniforms away from us, and they wanted to issue us, it was September, and they issued us what they called suntans, the, the light uh, colored, and uh, the uh, winter garments were OD, with the, you know, the dark, dark color. And that's what those were, the Eisenhower jackets. And we were so proud of those. They took them away from us, and, we, and they almost caused a riot there. That poor captain had never been overseas. She didn't know what the score was. And she says, oh, well, it might make you feel better if you know what they're going to do with them. She says, what are they going to do with them? 
Oh, they're going to send them back for, to the poor French girls. Oh, we, we liked to lynch her. <laughs> but we, you know, you, you can't fight the army. We, some of the girls tried it. I don't know how they made out. I just wanted out, so I thought, oh, well, okay. But I was so burned up about that. We had to go home in these brand new suntans. With, it meant nothing to us, you know. So you didn't get them back? No, we didn't get them back. Uh -uh. They sent them over to the French girls. <laughs> Those French girls, <laughs> they hired them to clean the barracks at one point. And well, they, they, were, they would do what they thought was a job, but it didn't suit the army, you know, you, you got a GI. When they say GI the floor, they mean you get down on your hands and knees with a scrub brush and you scrub the floor. Well, these poor French girls, they didn't know, uh, you know, their idea of, of mopping the floor was to wrap a r wet rag around the broom and <laughs> that wasn't good enough for the army. So they, they fired those and guess who had to GI the floor? We did. <laughs> so then they told they tell us they're sending our Eisenhower jackets back to those girls. And we, oh, gee, that that just we just blew up that poor captain. She didn't know what to make. Well, she didn't understand. She'd never been overseas. She didn't know. You know, to her it didn't mean anything. <laughs> but, but stuff like that, I don't know. <laughs> Was there a did war create an equality? For, for women, were you seen as, as women in the service or were you just all seen as service people? No, I don't think it was equal, equal no. That's, we were, we were uh, no, we were women in service, I think. That equality stuff came along later, I, I, I think, as I can remember it. No, we were definitely the women in service. The guys did not treat us like, like we were guys, you know. But when, like when we had a leave in Paris, my buddy and I, after the war ended the, over there, and we started out to see the town a little bit, you know, we got about two blocks from the hotel, and we had a cry goes up all around us, American girls, and they kept, you know, they weren't, a, if it was equality, they would have ignored us. And the uh, GIs came running from all around surrounded us, American girls, <laughs> like that. So I don't think that they looked on us as, as equal to them. And they'd like to tease us. I told you how that wax and waves will win the war, like that. Uh, you wouldn't call that equal, would you? <laughs> no, you know. Oh, there was a lot of kidding, good-natured kidding back and forth. There, there no meanness that I ever ran across. It was, it was so just, you must have been a real minority over there then. Well, yeah, we were, you know. And, of course, the, the British girls resented the heck out of us. We'd go to the dances, and there we were, <laughs> butting in on their <laughs> guys, you know. Because, oh, they really went for the Yanks. Well, for, for one thing, uh, they had a lot of money, and they could give them things that, that they hadn't had for years. But it wasn't only that. Uh, Yanks, uh, I, n I noticed over there and I remembered it, they have a, a, well, I guess it's from the freedom, you know, but they have, they'll walk down the street like they own the place, and the British don't walk like that. <laughs> they didn't. And, and they were big and husky and healthy and good-looking, and, and they'd come down the road and all the women were eyeing them, you know. They just ha have a presence, I guess you could call it that the, the Frenchmen didn't have. They were all, well, not all, I guess they have tall ones too, but they, they were much, uh, next to the Yanks, they didn't look nearly as alive and healthy and, and like, they didn't, the British didn't either. They were, uh, you know, they're all brave fighters, but even, uh, they just didn't have that look that the Yanks had, and the women really went for that. <laughs> you know, oh, you you could always tell a Yank a block away. They just they walk with their head up like they own the earth. <laughs> well, it's just the way we've been. Uh, I remember I went to to see my brother one time, and I could see him three blocks down the road. He always walked like like he was the king of the walk, <laughs> and he came striding along there, head up, just like he owned the place. <laughs> I thought, oh, that's John. I couldn't even see his face. He was so far away. 
<laughs> that was him. And okay. not just the way they all were. I'm going to switch tapes here. This is... Oh, well, I don't have any sins like that to confess. So, At least uh, not that you're going to confess while your daughter's in the room, I know. So. <laughs> well, I'm ignoring her over there. <laughs> I didn't realize she was there. I'm not here. Huh? I'm not here. I'm a figment of your imagination. What'd she say? She says she's a figment of your imagination. She's not uh, here right now. She's more than a figment. I've known her a few years. I would never call you a figment, dear. Just get back to your interview. <laughs> now, you, you were, um, even though you weren't on the front, front line, you still were nearby a lot of activity that was... Well, uh, the closest we, we came was that Battle of the Bulge part where they were coming over. Uh, oh, there's... This one, I'll tell you this one, I was so stupid. <laughs> when we were in Chartres, uh, oh, about two miles away, I guess, there was a prison camp. And was, they told us there were 5,000 prisoners there, but they were all women who had collaborated with the Germans, and the French had taken them and shaved them bald. When they imprisoned them, they shaved them all bald. So. We thought that would be funny, to, uh, whole hundreds of bald-headed women. <laughs> we wanted to go. My daughter, Lisa, the one that was contacted, she thinks that's the funniest story because we wanted to see these bald-headed women. So we took out across the field and went over to see them. But the thing was, this was, this was early on when we had just, the Germans had just moved back. And all along the roads, there were signs that said, mines cleared to hedges. That meant the fields had not been cleared. And we go tramping across these minefields <laughs> without a thought to see the bald-headed women. <laughs> and Lisa said, gee, I might not have been born. <laughs> <laughs> we could have been blown up. So what were you time. thinking that, that you would you would be able to see the mine or you just? Oh no, it? they were buried. So you didn't they, even they, think they anything. Buried just... We didn't even think about it. We just went across. <laughs> but I, I guess we remembered it later. I don't know. I remember my my boyfriend that that evening when he, he I told him what we did and he boy he bawled me out. <laughs> you you fools! You could have been blown up out there. Oh, well, we didn't think about that. We, we just thought it was a funny thing, and we went hiking across the fields. <laughs> then we, oh, yeah, they do have those signs up all along the roads. They had just cleared the roads so you, the troops could come forward, but, but they hadn't had time to clear all the fields yet. But, but nothing happened, so I guess either they weren't mined or we missed the mines. <laughs> I don't know. There were about, oh, I don't know, five or six of us we went across. But, oh, that was a sight. Can you imagine hundreds of bald-headed women? <laughs> it just was a ridiculous sight. But the, the French were very, very mad at them, you know. They had collaborated with the, the German officers and been mistresses of them and like that, so... So I guess they did. We didn't have much sympathy for them because we figured they were traitors to their country, you know. So we really, we just thought it was funny. <laughs> so was it the type of camp where you just walk up and it was just like a, a well, it fenced? Was, and you it could... was just a, an open fence, yeah. We didn't get too close, you know, but close enough to see them. It was just, just a high fence with barbed wire along the top. They had a riot there uh, while we were stationed there. And we were, we were not allowed to go into town. We were a little ways out of town. We used to be able to go into town to go shopping and like, but we couldn't go in without an armed escort when they had the riot there. And uh, that was, <laughs> we, <laughs> well, I guess we weren't very nice to the guys. They were not fighting men. They were, they were support troops like we were. But of course, when they went through basic, they had been taught to shoot and all that, and they had been issued rifles, but they were not really fighting soldiers. <laughs> the guy I dated was a weather observer, <laughs> you know, in, a, in an office. He, he was not a frontline fighter. So we were kidding about that. We said, geez, they should just give us the guns. We could take care of ourselves just as well. <laughs>
<laughs> I don't know if they, they if they had ever had to shoot anybody if they could have done it even, but uh, they weren't you know they weren't so, sissies or cowards or anything, but they they were just not trained soldiers. They weren't fighting men. <laughs> They hadn't been trained. You have to train for that, whatever you're doing, you know. Now, you, you mentioned going into town to go shopping. Yeah. Shopping, I mean, clothes shopping? What are you shopping for? Oh, whatever you wanted. We went, well, don't ask me. None of us could really speak French, you know. And uh, we went in, we thought we'd like to have some bullion cubes, you know. And that's the way Americans say it, bullion, right? Okay, so we go around these stores looking for bullion cubes and the, well, no, I don't think, you know, uh, no, no, no compri, I don't understand, you know. And finally, we came to one store and asked for bullion cubes and the guy says, he thinks a minute and he says, ah, we, oui, we oui, all. Oh. <laughs> we couldn't even pronounce it. <laughs> he caught on to what we were trying to say. So the city was, was, well, operating back oh, to... Oh, yeah, by that time, the Germans had been run, moved back, you know. By the time we got to Chartres, there's a beautiful cathedral there. It's one of the cathedral towns, you know. France is noted for its gorgeous cathedral, and they are just beautiful. We went and visited that one. Then when we went to Reims, that has another beautiful cathedral. That one was closer to the front. It was all sandbagged when we were there, and you couldn't go inside. But the Chartres one had been opened, and we did go inside to see that. Oh, it was magnificent, just beautiful. And later, after the war, uh, I went on to Paris on a three-day pass, and we only had three days, so we thought, well, we might as well go on a tour to see the high, high spots, you know. So we came to the Notre Dame, which is a very famous cathedral, and I thought, oh, th I want to see this beautiful thing. As we stepped through the door, that magnificent pipe organ started to play, and I was just spellbound. I just stopped dead in my tracks. I couldn't move. It sounded just like music from heaven. I, you know, it was beautiful. The rest of them went on tour, and I was still standing there when they came back. I couldn't move. <laughs> <laughs> that or pipe organ played the whole time. The rest of them just kind of ignored it, but it just got me. I was still standing at the door. I never did see the Notre Dame. <laughs> oh, only the front <laughs> section there. But there are these great big pipes on the wall. Oh, huge. I'd never seen anything like them. And you can imagine the sound in in that cathedral. Oh, it just I couldn't describe it. It was just magnificent. And I, that's what I remember of the Notre Dame. <laughs> See, that's what what I think is interesting. I mean, that was the uh, tail end of the war, but I think... Yeah, that was... Uh, well, it was still going on in, in Japan, you know, the Pacific, but it ended, as you know, it ended in Europe in May, May 8th. And then it went on till what, August 14th or something like that in the Pacific, yeah. See, and that's the interesting thing is that the history books kind of leave out because the history books talk about war and uh -huh. all you think is military people and shooting and all that going on. Uh -huh. But yet, there are these troops that are coming up behind or around, and there's still kind of this average, everyday life. I mean, you were oh, almost yeah. a tourist of Europe to a certain yeah, extent. That, that's right. Uh -huh. Yeah, they always emphasize, well, they emphasize the fighting part of a war, and they leave out a lot of the human part, because uh, we didn't change. We were human beings, and we were living as, you know, as well as we could. We had fun in between. Well, the, the infantry, too, they'd, they'd pull them back on a rest, and then they'd go into town, and uh, they'd have fun and uh, like that, you know. Uh, it was quite a relief for them, more than for us, I guess. But, but, but they do leave out the human side of it when they talk about war. They'll emphasize some big battle or or something, or the casualties, or something like that. But the, you're right, they don't deal with the actual people, the human part of it, do they? They no. kind of skip that. Even they, though they're talking about human beings, but they, they leave out that part of it. Yeah. The, the little shop owner, the, the baker, the... Yeah. I mean, what happens... At, I mean, we know we hear about the Germans coming through a town, or the Americans coming through a town, yeah. but they never talk about... I mean, and we, we hear about bombed out towns, but what happens afterwards? Yeah, what happened to the people? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you about one. When we lived, uh, when we were in Namur, 
out back of, of the building was a whole row of houses and, and people, you know, the Belgian people. Well, one old lady there, I guess, oh, she wasn't all that old. I guess she was in her 50s, a heavy set old lady. She took in washing, and we used to take our laundry out there. And uh, we got acquainted with her. She was such a nice lady. Her husband had been killed in a bomb raid. The, the Germans had bombed the town, and her husband had been killed. And she had one son, Alme, who was 16 years old. He was so cute. He was learning to speak English. And he'd come out with his little book and practice with us. And she was so dear. Whenever we'd go over with our laundry, she'd invite us to her. She'd always have a big pot of soup there, and she'd invite us. And we got to be very friendly with them. I have pictures of them somewhere. And that Ame was so cute. He he was just 16, a nice-looking boy and kind of big for his age. And he would always come and talk to us to practice his English, <laughs> and he'd get his words wrong. And finally, when finally when we were leaving, he gave me a picture of, of him, and he wrote on the back, in memory of our intimate friendship. <laughs> and the girls teased me to death about that. He didn't realize what he was saying, you know. He, he got his word. <laughs> he couldn't quite get the English. And the girls just teased me. They said, oh boy, 16-year-old, fuck, you know. I still have that picture somewhere, <laughs> and I picture of his mother. And uh, when I got back home, uh, they had not seen leather shoes since the war had started, and I sent them each a pair of real leather shoes. And oh, they were so thrilled! They just oh, leather shoes. They they wore wooden clogs, and that's all they had all during the war. So uh, they were very friendly people. The the Belgian people were more friendly than the French ones were, I think. They, they uh, really seemed to appreciate us more. So that's usually where you would end up, would be in a, in a village like that or a city. With, with what? You, you usually ended up uh, setting up quarters in a, in a city or a village as, as the Germans got pushed out. Yeah, then we moved up. We had to move up because the planes had to, you know, they couldn't fly the distance. So that's, we kept moving up. And the 8th stayed in England because they had the distance with the big bombers. Yeah, we, we first went to Chartres, which I think that's south of Paris. And well, when we went through, we went in, when we moved up to Reims, which is above Paris, I'm trying to think the map, uh, we went in a truck convoy. It was a big, long convoy. The whole headquarters moved at once. <clears throat> and as we went through Paris, the people were lined on both sides of the street. They were cheering us as we went through. And, uh, you know, the really big thing, the Americans said, uh, Paris had been liberated when? In, in uh, I think, in July, wasn't it, that year? I think. It had been liberated. We didn't liberate it, but we were coming along. When did we move up? In October. And, uh, oh, they did just cheering us along the way. And, and from way off, the first thing we saw was the, uh, that Eiffel Tower against the sky. You've probably seen pictures of that. If you've, uh, Maybe you've been there. I don't know. But uh, that was the first thing we saw. I said, oh, there's Paris up there, you know, the Eiffel Tower. But uh, we just drove through it and on on to Reims and set up there. But, uh, yeah, we kept moving up, and then when the Germans got pushed farther back, we moved up to Belgium, and that's where we were when the war ended. Boy, that was a great day. <laughs> you should have seen those people. Oh, man. They got out in the streets there, and I say for three days and nights without stopping. They had bands playing, people yelling, hugging each other, just uh, without any let-up for three solid days and nights. They kept that up. They were so happy. <laughs> but then a, a funny thing, uh, soon after, when they got a little settled down, they said, well, you can go home now. We want to have our buildings back. <coughs> Thanks. You did your job. You, we want our buildings back now. <laughs> that was the attitude. See, the well, we were moving out, you know. They started sending us back on points like that article I, I brought you went out, you got a, let's see, you got one point for each month of service. This was the wax. I don't know what they did with the guys. You got one point for each month of service 
another point for each month overseas. Then you got five points for each battle star you had on your ETO ribbon. And then they added that all up. And you had to have 44 points to be eligible to go home. Well, when I added mine up, I had 66. So I'm ready to go. <laughs> you know, Oh, that time, you know, we, we were ready to go home then, you know, that was the big deal. And so uh, I got home in September. Oh, but that was, that was funny too. In August, uh, well, they didn't know what to do with us, you know. When the war ended, we our, our jobs were gone. Bombardment Division, we had nothing to do. And they changed it to the 9th Air Division then, so that we were the 9th. And, and that's on my discharge, and that irked me, because Bombardment Division sounded much more, you know. <laughs> The Ninth Air Division, what well, that sounds like nothing, but that's what's on my discharge anyway. They changed it because there was no bombardment, there was nothing to do. So we were out of jobs, and then, then they had trouble. They just sent us here, there, and the other place. I finally had to serve as a, a secretary to some captain that he went scrounging around. I got a lot, I don't know what, he was scrounging around. Uh, He'd go places and uh, to, I don't know, collect all kinds of stuff that were left was left behind. I don't know what his job was. He's a really nice guy, though. I didn't have much to do there, and he'd bring me back things. I have little things, like I have a letter opener from Germany that I still have that he gave me like that. But, but they just uh, found work for us because our jobs were really over. So then we got to go. They set up a, a leave down in, in uh, Nice in France. Uh, let's see, Nice was for the enlisted, and Cannes was for the officers. We were separated always. <laughs> and uh, that was kind of funny, because both my brothers were officers. <laughs> and I also had a cousin and an uncle in that were officers. <laughs> but I couldn't, I wasn't good enough to associate with them, you know. <laughs> I didn't get it, we just laughed about it. But, that, but they separated us, so I, went, I had a leave in August. I had a leave down, a week's leave in, in uh, Nice. And oh, that was nice. They put us up at nice hotels and, and they had trips around where you could go. We went up to what grass where they made all the perfumes and stuff like that. It was really fun and, and there were GIs and, and girls and you'd meet people and, and go dancing. And, but we had a grand time. So then it came time to go home and this pilot, had us all out there. He was chucking names off of his, his thing. And he says, which one is Cresto? And he's looking there. Says, you know what? <laughs> Me? <laughs> and he says, I have orders to bring you back. If I have to leave all the rest, you're going home. <laughs> and the rest of them all, ah! <laughs> So, <laughs> me and my buddy then, we, we went on a plane load, uh, this was disgusting, we went on a plane load of medical personnel, they were doctors and nurses, and they just ignored us. They treated us like we weren't there, except one couple, and they were a married couple, a nurse and a doctor, and they were the only ones that were nice to us. And uh, I thought, uh, why do medical, you know, we didn't care, but I thought, why would medical people take that attitude? But they did. And then, uh, oh, when we, we had to come down, there was something wrong with the plane. We had to come down uh, at Lyon and stay overnight. So they had to put us up in the hotel with the officers. <laughs> we were just kind of getting a kick out of it, you know. But they were very actually nasty. They, they wouldn't have anything to do with it. They wouldn't even speak to us, except that one couple. And we went, oh, this, this was really bad. We went down that night for dinner to the cafe that they had, the restaurant downstairs. And we were stopped at the door and told we, were not, we couldn't eat with the officers. We, and they led us back to the kitchen we had to sit in the kitchen and have our dinner, and we're not allowed to eat with the officers. Now, wasn't that ridiculous? I thought that that was, and, and then the next day when we were all down in the lobby waiting to leave for the plane, that nice couple came up to us and they said, where were you? We looked for you at dinner. We saved places for you. And they were so nice. 
And we told them, well, they wouldn't let us eat in there. And they just looked at each other. Oh, they were just, they, oh, you could see, they felt they just looked at each other and shook their, oh. Well, that, that was pretty raw, we thought, you know. But that's the way they were. You were not to associate with the officers. You just weren't good enough. And that, that's everybody, ridiculous. Everybody fought in the same war, though. Yeah, we fought the same war. And those officers couldn't function without us enlisted uh, underneath them doing the job. You know, it was ridiculous, but it was the attitude at the time. I don't know what exists now. Maybe it's different. I, I don't know. I doubt it. I doubt it. <laughs> now, you, you talked a lot about a buddy that, did, did you, a, a, a woman friend that worked with you all along? Did you oh, stay with I the had same a, group? Or? When I went up, when I, I didn't, in, in basic training, we were all new. I didn't have a buddy there. Well, I had a, one little girl that I kind of liked. She was from Texas. The, you get acquainted with the people, you know. But she uh, she uh, got out. They let you get out if you really wanted to go home, you know, if you couldn't take it. And she wanted, She got homesick for Texas, and she went back to Texas. And I said, oh, <laughs> she was in the hospital. They, they'd send them to the hospital for a few days to check them out. And there were, there were oh, three or four of them there with her that were going home. So the night before she was to leave, I went over to see her to... I snuck out of the barracks to go see her. I was always doing stuff like that. It was a Friday night, and you're supposed to stay home and GI the barracks on Friday for the Saturday morning inspection. And you couldn't go out. You had to wear what they called Class A uniform with your tie and everything. So I snuck, I put on my Class A uniform, you're laughing, and I snuck out the back door. <laughs> and I didn't have a pass. You had to have a pass when you left the area. So I went over to the hospital. Nobody stopped me. I just walked along like I owned the place, you know. <laughs> Nobody stopped me. <laughs> and I went over to the hospital, and, and I, was, I, was having such, I was having a great time over there. And I was kidding with the girls, and one of them said, gee, you make it sound like such fun. I wish I wasn't getting out. I thought, well, your choice, kid. You know. And then when I went, I went back. I came. I snuck in the back door, and one of the girls grabbed me and says, "You damn fool! Get in line." They they were giving out. It was payday, and you had to get in line by an alphabet. And I was a C. She says, but I, I don't know. They were all in their fatigues because they'd been working, and I wasn't. But nobody questioned it. <laughs> they didn't notice. So she, she said, give me your hat and get in line. <laughs> we always kind of took care of each other like that, but, but that was funny. And, uh, no, I didn't really have a buddy. You didn't have uh, time. You were very busy all the time. You know, they really worked you a lot and breaking you in. And it was only a month training at that time. I don't know if it's worth And then uh, we got our orders for different schools that we were going to. And so I got radio school, then I was tickled. Well, then on the way up, we traveled by train in those days. And on the way up to Kansas City, I met the girl that became my, my buddy. We were just inseparable all, all through the school, and we had a grand time. And we picked up a little group from the GIs next door, and, and we just, oh, we were always doing things in, in that group. And, and finally, I, uh, I started dating one guy, and she started dating one. And, and we'd sneak out. You weren't allowed to leave the city, you know. So we'd sneak out and go across the river to Kansas City, Kansas. There was a nice park there where you could go swimming and all like that. We'd sneak out every Sunday <laughs> and go. I always did things like that. I don't know why. I always got away with it. I never got caught. <laughs> did you stay in touch with uh, your buddy uh, after the service? Well, we then when we got, that was a five-month course. And we both passed. There was no problem with that. Uh, and then we were all sitting in this big room uh, waiting for our orders. Well, the whole class knew that we were inseparable buddies, so they were rooting for us to go together. And we were, we were all sitting there, and they were reading out various... Uh, they would send us a group here and a group there. There were 50 in the class, so they were sorting it out. There was a row of officers up there, w women officers, and they were reading out the list. So they came to this uh, uh, Truex Field in Madison, Wisconsin, and they started reading, and Cresto came up on the list. And then we were sitting there holding on to each other. Oh, her name was Palantis with a P. 
So we're going through this whole big list, and the whole class is just kind of breathless there. And finally they came down, and they called Palantis, and the whole class went, ah! And those officers looked up and said, what was that all about? And somebody told them, well, those two buddies, they wanted to go together, and the officer just... And so we got to go there. But then uh, we got up there, and I thought we were going to be radio operators. Oh, boy, we're out of school. We're going to be radio operators. We get up there, and they told us we're supposed to be instructors. And that's something I cannot do. I could not, even in school, I couldn't stand up and give a report in class. I just said, so I thought, no, I can't do that. I just can't do it. So I went to the captain, the CO, and I told, I told her, that's just something I, I can't do, ma'am. I, I just can't. And she, she understood. She was nice. So then she found me a job on the other side of the field in a mess personnel office, just an office job. Well, I was the only girl on that side of the field. I was the only girl in the office, and I was the only girl on that side of the field. I always got into these situations. And so I had a ball over there. There was an office full of GIs, and the captain was a young lieutenant. And if it weren't for that guy, I wouldn't be here talking to you now, all these years later. Because he, he was so nice. He wasn't flirty, it wasn't that. He just, uh, I was the only girl there and he was being very nice to me. And I, uh, I was writing to this boy back home that I had known and wartime, I imagined I was in love with this Johnny back home. So all the time I'd be writing, I didn't have much to do, it was just a make work job really. <laughs> I was always raving about my Johnny back home. Okay, so, so. I was always writing letters to Johnny and talking about Johnny, and, and this lieutenant wouldn't hear it. He, he, was, he was the neatest guy. One time when we were all working, it was the sort of thing he would do. He had a sense of humor, and we were all just uh, working there quietly for once. Nobody was talking. So he comes stalking out of his office, slams a book down on the desk, and says, it's too damn quiet in here. Then he turns around and goes back in his office. He was kind of a screwball, but he was the nicest guy. He ran a tight ship. You did your work, but he had a sense of humor, and he made it kind of fun, you know. So then one day he calls me, and, and, and Johnny had been, he was in the Army. He'd been transferred down to Florida. He was at, at Tampa, some field at Tampa there. So the lieutenant calls me in the office and tells me he got me a transfer down to Florida so I could be near Johnny. And nobody, the word on the field was that it was impossible to get a transfer off that field. He had gone clear to St. Louis to the headquarters to get me a transfer down to Florida. And I didn't want to go. I didn't want to leave my buddy. But I couldn't tell him that. He'd, he'd gone to all that trouble, and he, you know, big smile, and I had to, th well, thank you. Gee, that's wonderful, you know. And then I, I went home, and I, gee, I have to leave Maria. I don't want to go. But I had no choice. I, I couldn't tell him that after that. So that we got separated then, and we were never together again. And she just stayed there, and then she went to Scott Field in Illinois, and she didn't have any adventure. <laughs> I had all the adventure. But if he hadn't sent me down to Florida, I would have just gone to Scott Field and stayed up there. Huh. I wouldn't have gone and what if he hadn't to, done that. What happened to Johnny? Oh, well, we got together and decided it was I decided <laughs> that I didn't really love him. And I, of course, met another dashing guy. He was a return uh, tail gunner from Europe, big hero on the base. He'd been he's shot down and captured in France, and the French people had smuggled him out of France, and he got back, and he was a big hero, and I met him at the pool one night, and started going with him, and then I thought, ah, oh, I like Jimmy better than Johnny, <laughs> you know, it was just, just wartime nonsense. So then, then they sent Jimmy out on a bond selling tour, and he was supposed to be gone for a couple of weeks. So I thought, well, I can't keep this up. I'll, I'll have to tell Johnny that it's all over, you know. Because we had kind of gotten engaged. He'd come up to see me that Christmas, and we'd gotten engaged. So 
I thought, no, the kindest thing is just to break it off. I didn't tell him about Jimmy, though. I thought that would really make him feel too bad. <coughs> I just told him that I, I had changed, my feelings had changed, you know. I did it as nice as I could, but that you can't stop from hurting somebody like that. Well, he took off, and I didn't see him again, but he kept writing to me for about a year, and I'd write back a nice letter, I'd answer him, but... But then I didn't hear from him anymore, so I figured I guess he got over it by now. So then, the off, as soon as, as Jimmy had left, my captain called me in. She had overseas orders, and she says, now you volunteered, for, I had volunteered for overseas. I, she said, you volunteered for overseas, you still want to go? And I thought, hell no, I don't want to go. Jimmy's going to come back in two weeks. <laughs> the timing was all off. So I told her some story that I had promised my mother I wouldn't go overseas. <laughs> and she let me off the hook. So a week later, and Jimmy's still gone, she calls me back in and she says, I have more overseas orders. She says, now you volunteered and this time you're going and don't give me any more cock and bull stories. <laughs> so I, I couldn't say that. Uh, what do you say to a captain? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> she knew I was just telling you the story. <laughs> but she let me off. The, so, the, so then I, that's when I went overseas. <laughs> there were about oh, about six of us. Like, well, I tell you, she called back uh, Anita from New York. <laughs> that was the same time. We all got a big kick out of that because everybody knew that they were rivals for that lifeguard. Oh, he was a big, handsome guy, you know. <laughs> they were they were fighting over him. But you're going to lose if you're farting with a captain. <laughs> you know? Better get that rank. A, low, a lowly corporal can't win a battle with a captain. <laughs> So we all went, that, that's when we went. Then we, we sailed on the Queen Elizabeth. That was neat. Oh, I had a, we got to leave. We were at Camp Shanks, New York. It was just a little ways out of, of New York City. Well, all my high school days, my buddy in high school, my buddy and I, we wanted to go to New York. We didn't want to be actresses or anything like that. It was just New York was the glamour place. Hollywood and New York were the big glamour places, and we already knew Hollywood upside down. We were autograph hounds in high school, so we knew Hollywood. And we, our dream was to go to New York, just to see the boulevard and you know Broadway and all that glamour spot. So here we were at Camp Shanks, and, and we'd each get a, a last leave we, before we went to the POE and, and embarked. So I got a, a leave for 6 o'clock Sunday night to 6 o'clock Sunday morning, a uh, Monday morning, a 12-hour leave now to go to New York. And then the only girl that got to leave with me, well, we knew each other, but she was an older woman. She was about, I think the, the age limit was 38. She was about 35. She had a 14-year-old daughter back home with her mother, and she was just a sourpuss. And this is what I went to New York with. <laughs> we're on the train. It took about an hour from where we were. We're on the train going in. And I was getting real excited. I was seeing the big buildings, you know, up ahead. And I, oh, New York, New York. And I'm, I'm jumping up and down. And she says, oh, you act just like my 14-year-old daughter. Squelch. <laughs> and so, so I wandered around New York with her. We, we got to Broadway. And we did go. We saw, remember Cab Calloway? We got to see him in person. We finally went in one of the shows there and saw him. But that was the only fun we had. There was nothing to do. On we saw Times Square. <coughs> so you've seen all those pictures of Times Square. So I saw the famous Times Square, and we just wandered around there. And we went to that, and then it was about midnight by that time. We thought, well, uh, what can we do? We can't wander around New York <laughs> at midnight. <laughs> he said, we'll just get in trouble or something. Well, in the big city, you know. So we went back to the base, and that was my leave in New York. <laughs> Great. <laughs> oh, that was funny. Did but would you, would you believe, I mean, this is funny, when we boarded the ship, it was just like a movie, you wouldn't believe. We boarded at midnight. We were, we were going up the gangplank at midnight, and on the dock... <laughs> 
with a full dress band playing over there. <laughs> Would you believe? Wow. Just like a movie with a full dress band and they were playing over there as we went up the gate like at midnight. I never forgot that. I thought that was so funny. We're going up there with our barracks bags over our shoulders, you know, trudging, and they're playing over there. On full dress. A whole, a whole band. <laughs> <coughs> that was funny. That was a beautiful ship. And they housed us in, in the first class cabins. That, uh, and they had the, all the, the stewards and everything that had served on the, the ship. It was a British ship, but it was, well, the Queen Mary, too. The two queens, if they were famous, I don't know if in yeah. your time, I guess you've heard of them, but, but you, you weren't young enough for World War II, <laughs> I'm sure. But the two queens, I sailed over on the Queen Elizabeth and back on the Queen Mary. Uh, but that steward was telling us those were the first class and they cost, which was big money in those days, he said they cost about $2,000 a trip, which in those days was, it was real money, you know. And we, we, of course, we didn't have them to ourselves. I think there were eight to a cabin, <laughs> double-deck bunks, but, but it was nice. It was better the guys were sleeping on the deck <laughs> down below. <laughs> well, the ship was just packed with troops, you know. I guess some of them had had uh, cabin or whatever they had been in uh, steerage class. <laughs> you know, we got to go first class. But we were confined to our cabins. We couldn't wander around the boat. So we didn't get, and we were so jealous of the nurses because they were just down the hall from us, a bunch of nurses. And of course they were all officers. So they had the run of the boat and we'd see them going by, you know, and we couldn't go out. We were so jealous of them. <laughs> did, did you face, um, I mean, because even being behind the front line, people come and Pardon? going. Even being behind the front line, there were people coming and going. Did you face much of the travesty of war, or, or were you kind of isolated from the travesty of, of... Well, you mean the tragic part? Well, what I told you about that plane, that was about the worst of it. We saw the dead gunners carried off like that, but no, we were behind, far enough back of the lines that you didn't really uh, see much of that. Uh, one time they sent me out with a couple of guys to, to get mattresses from some place. It was when we were in, in uh, Reims, which wasn't too far back, I mean, because they were strafing the city, but it was back, it wasn't in, oh, I don't know, maybe 80 miles back from the front, something like that. So you weren't, you couldn't hear the firing or anything like that. But they sent us out uh, pretty far out to, to get some mattresses, pick up some mattresses. And we came to this little town, I don't know how far we went, but uh, I made a fool of myself as usual. I saw the, this sign uh, across the street and down a little ways. It was a building that had a big red cross on it. Well, the red cross, meant to, to me, all I had seen of it was, was uh, uh, where they had the little canteen where they'd give you coffee and donuts, you know. So I said, oh, look, donuts, let's go. And those guys looked so disgusted. They said, that's an aid station. <laughs> so we were close enough to the front then that, that, that it was an aid station where they were treating the wounded soldiers. And I made a total fool of myself. <laughs> All it meant to me was donuts. Exactly. I mean, that's the... Yeah, so we really, no, we really didn't, uh, uh, you know, we didn't see any wounded soldiers or anything like that. We weren't that close because the headquarters had to be uh, back fairly safe. Oh, we were open to, well, like in England when the buzz bombs came over and like that, but, but nobody bombed. We were far enough from London. You know, London got the heck bombed out of it, but... I guess that's why we were up there. It was called Mark's Hall. It had been a gentleman's country estate that was taken over by the, the Air Force. And no, we were not that close. The worst of it that we saw was that plane that came in. And that was only because it couldn't make it to its own base. Ordinarily, they didn't land there. We had an airstrip, but it, it wasn't, uh, you know, there weren't any planes stationed there that went on raids. 
<coughs> was just probably for the officers and like that. H have you ever gone back? Oh, I went to Germany once. <coughs> I'm talking too much. I should have brought a cough drop or something. You want some? <coughs> we're just about done here. Oh. No, we were not uh, that close because uh, the headquarters had to, of necessity, be back where it wouldn't get bombed out. And the, I guess the worst w was, uh, well, during the Battle of the Bulge when all those little things were happening around Reims, like I told you, they shot the guard on our gate and, and they machined that one in the alley and the, the planes came over. That was the worst of it. But that, how long did that last? A few weeks, the Battle of the Bulge. It lasted, it started just before Christmas, I remember that. I don't remember when it ended, but it, it lasted a little while. And then they, well, we moved, then we moved on up to Belgium and it was almost over by that time. We moved up there in April. Yeah, April, April 12th, I remember that because it was the day that Roosevelt died. If you, and we were just loading on the plane for Belgium when we got the word that Roosevelt had died. And he was one of our heroes too. We always thought he was great. Him and Eisenhower and Patton, I guess, were our, our <laughs> heroes. <coughs> so that kind of depressed us all then. He was, he was certainly a, a person, wasn't he? He, he was, uh, I don't know, he was a very dynamic individual. And in spite of it, he was a cripple, but he, it didn't bother him. He didn't let it stop him. And I always admired that. And he was, I guess, the only president we, president we had that was serving four terms. <coughs> he died in the, just the beginning of that fourth term. But he was president from the time I was 12 years old. And I was 25 when he died. That was amazing. But I always liked him. I don't care Democrats or Republicans. I'm not much for that. I usually register Republican, but I vote for whoever I think is the best one. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's lucky I voted for Governor Locke, and he's the one that I have, you know, that ceremony right, that I'm supposed over. to go to? Yeah. Well, I, I don't know why they chose me. I might have been the only whack she heard from, that lady because there aren't that many of us around and it's hard to find one that served overseas. There is another girl in, in our, uh, at Clare House that did serve overseas, but she didn't serve in France. She served in, in North Africa and Italy. Oh, really? Yeah, she might be interesting to talk to, I don't know. Uh, I, she called me over one time when I was first there. Somebody had told her I was a veteran and but she didn't. I tried to get her to tell me her story, and she did. She wouldn't much talk about it. Huh. And I think she must have had interesting adventures. She said, you know, she moved up through Italy when the troops took Italy and went on up, and she was in North Africa. And, but she's never talked. She never talked to me since. She always sits. There's a bunch of them. There's a lounge downstairs. And there's a whole bunch of them that sit around in that lounge. I call it the gossip circle. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, they, they like to sit and talk. They'll be sitting there all afternoon. And she's always down there, but she's never talked to me since. And I kind of wanted to trade stories with her, but she seems kind of withdrawn-like. And so, I don't know, maybe, maybe she wouldn't want to talk. She wasn't an officer, was she? You know, <laughs> I, I don't know. She... Uh, well, she couldn't have had it too bad. Yeah, no. You know, the, the veterans that don't talk about it are the ones that were really in it. Like you meet, uh, well, a lot of them from Vietnam. Well, and that's, yeah. with, with this project, that's a lot of what we've really kind of sought out. We're, we're to find a lot of the people who have quietly for 50 years yeah. sat and, and never discussed World War II because, again, like you said, those were a lot of the people that were well, well, doing their job. and, and Well, uh, I know a lot of them who were, were really in it, especially I'm aware of the Vietnam one because that was so terrible. I don't think we should never have been in that one. <laughs> that was awful. And they took an awful beating, our troops did. And I've met a lot of them over the years, and they just won't talk about it because it was so bad. Yeah. 
Now, the ones that he'll talk, like me, were not really into all that. There's World War II vets who won't talk about it because it was so bad. Especially the Pacific, I think. That, that was much worse than Europe. I think they had it a lot worse over there. They had to fight and take those islands one after another, and the Japs were dug in, and the Japs were just horrid. Boy. Well, they say, and I've talked to a couple, some Merrill's Marauders and some people that were in Europe, and they said it's just apples and oranges trying to compare Europe and, and South Pacific. It was just two different wars. Yeah, yeah, and, I and think it was. Jungle warfare. And that was, uh, well, the Navy had a lot to do in, in the Pacific, and they did very little in the, uh, Europe. They, they weren't needed there. But they suffered a lot of casualties, too, in the Pacific. Oh, war, you know, war is hell at best. <laughs> but those uh, like me who serve in it, uh, I think the majority are support troops. Well, I know they are, because they used to tell us it takes eight support troops for one who is serving up front. So figure that out over the whole thousands of them. <laughs> you got most of them are in the rear. And know. that's the thing that the history books kind of left out. They do, yeah. yes. And people don't realize that. They don't realize. I'm sure that everybody who had a son over there that served in our headquarters thought he, oh, my son's in France, you know, and they just visualized him and fighting and everything. They weren't in any danger, no more than we were. And, but, and, but, and that's interesting because Andy Rooney in his book talks about that, that some of the people that came back that were in positions like that yeah. felt ashamed because because they had seen all the newsreels about the, quote, heroes. Yeah. you know, And so they came back and people say, well, were you up fighting? And they'd say, well, no. And then eventually they would just quiet down and the people didn't realize that well, it I took th all of those people. I think that's a wrong attitude because the, the fighting men could not function without the support troops. Okay, you're not a hero if you're in the support, in the rear. You're certainly not a hero, but you're not a coward either. You know, you're serving your country, and you deserve credit for that. But the heroes were the ones that were doing the actual fighting. I consider my brother was a hero. He was shot down over Germany. He went down and through all that danger. Those guys were heroes. Uh, the ones, well, even even the mechanics on the ground that serviced the planes, they weren't the heroes. It was the crews that went out with the planes. And in the infantry, it wasn't the guys in the rear. There were guys in the rear, too. But the ones in the front were the heroes. They were risking their lives. If you're risking your life, you're a hero. <laughs> That's the way I figure. But those who came back like that, they shouldn't have let people shame them. What were those people that shamed them? What were they doing? They weren't even over there. Well, see, that's, yeah. You know, that, that's the way I feel. We interviewed, and it's real interesting, a merchant marine. In fact, the guy's name is Harold Schmidt up in the... Um, oh, I knew a merchant marine, too. Now, those guys went through a, a lot of danger. And you see, they weren't recognized. No, they weren't. And they still aren't getting full credit. And they had a higher chance, they had a higher rate of mortality than the Marines did. Uh, I wouldn't doubt it, because yeah. they were not a fighting ship. They were not a fighting crew. Oh, I sp no doubt they had guns, but they were not a, an armed battleship, you well, know? And, that, and that's what, what, just like we wanted to break, well, and that's what we were doing in Burma. We were trying to break the, the supply line, and so we could get, we didn't have to fly over the hump. We could get our supply line in. Well, yeah. the same thing with those merchant marines. They were mm -hmm. our supply line. And that's, the, that's what Harold said. He said, you know those tanks that got over there? You know those marines that got over there? You know those... Mm -hmm. The food yeah. that got over there, it had to get there somehow. And uh -huh. well, there you go. That's right. Yes, yeah. I, I knew a merchant marine, a, a guy that I had known before, and I met him again after the war, just accidentally. And uh, he'd been through, he had sailed uh, across the Atlantic all through the war. Huh. But they didn't get any recognition, and that that's not right. They just, they build up uh, some of all of the more dashing heroics. And the stories are more, you know, it's kind of dull just to tell about sailing across the sea. And although it was dangerous for them, uh, we had, uh, as we crossed, we had a submarine drill every morning. Uh, nothing attacked us, but <laughs> we had the drill because there were submarines out there. Well, see. you know, the, the, the queens traveled alone. Then you know why they traveled alone? 
because if they were in convoy, they would be slowed down and they would be the target. The queen would be the target. So they sent them off alone and they zigzagged. That one of, that steward told us, they zigzagged all the way across and they would change course in the time it would take to aim a torpedo so that they couldn't be hit direct. A direct hit would s probably sink them, but if they got a glancing blow, they could maybe survive. That was the theory anyway. I, as far as I know, neither one was ever hit. I, I don't know why, I, because they were quite a target, <laughs> you know? And going alone, they had no protection, really, unless maybe there were submarines down there, but uh, we weren't told that. <laughs> there could have been, I guess. But uh, they, they took six days to cross from New York, and we landed in Gorok, Scotland. And coming home, it only took four days because they didn't zigzag. <laughs> they came straight across from Southampton to New York. Oh, you should have seen that welcome. I, maybe you've seen it in movies. Oh, when we sailed into New York Harbor, and the Queen came out. Oh, I can't talk. I'll start to cry. I get, I get emotional when I think of it. But the, the whole, the, the, everything was lined with people, flags flying, signs all over that said, Welcome home, well done. As we came into the harbor, boats coming, little boats coming out to meet us, horns blowing, whistles blowing, everybody screaming and yelling as the Queen came in. Oh, that, 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 was, that was a day, <laughs> and we were home from the war. The war was, was over on both sides, and we were coming home. That was great. <laughs> there was a young GI right in front of me. Now, you've heard the, uh, this, but it actually happened. As we were going down the gangplank, this little, you were a young guy. He couldn't have been more than 20 or so. And he got to the bottom of the gangplank. He actually dropped on his knees and kissed the ground. <laughs> yeah, that actually happened. I've heard people, they tell that, but it, it actually happened. He was so grateful to be back home alive. <laughs> well, it had to be just probably one of the most memorable events uh, coming in the harbor there with all of the... It was, and there was a whole row of, uh, what was it, Red Cross ladies? No, no, no. I don't know if they were Red Cross. I guess they were Red Cross. Anyway, there were ladies all lined up handing us little cartons of milk because we hadn't had any milk overseas, <laughs> just powdered, powdered stuff. And they were handing us cartons of real milk as we came off the ship. <laughs> oh, that, that was a day. But that harbor, I can still, still see it was just, oh, it was, uh, everybody in New York must have been out there. It just looked like it was just mobs of people all the way around the harbor. As we came in, uh, all the whistles blowing, the people yelling, bands playing. <laughs> it was a great day. Well, that was a long war. And when it was over, there was just a big relief, you know. It was, it was a tough war. But, you know, that was one I felt that had to be fought. Hitler had to be stopped. That man had to be crushed. He, he was just, oh, he was just destroying every... And I never could understand how one man can have such power, you know? Nobody dared to defy him. Why would, how, how could one man gain that kind of power where he could murder people, imprison them, and do anything he wanted? And he must have been crazy. He must have been insane to carry on like he did. But I felt like he had to be stopped. And so I felt that was a just war. And some of them, well, Vietnam, that was, that was just a mess. I don't think we belonged in that at all. But, but World War II, they had to stop him. I suppose World War I, although Kaiser Wilhelm wasn't as bad as Hitler from what I've ever read of him, that was slightly before my time. But, <laughs> but uh, don't you think that war had to be fought, oh, World yeah. War II? Oh, yeah, there's no he had, They had to stop him. And boy, that was a great day when his death was made known. Wow. I think, I think uh, uh, several million people must have cheered that. Now, you know, wh how can one man have such an effect on the world? Well, it's, 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 it's charisma in reverse. 
you know, yeah. Kennedy had a charisma about, but it was yeah. a positive charisma. Yeah. My father was, as a child, was over in Germany, and he was there on May Day, and I forget what city he was in, and he didn't see Hitler speak, but they pumped Hitler in over the speakers. Uh -huh. And he said it was the scariest but most powerful thing that he ever saw because this whole city stopped when the man spoke. And he, he just was such a powerful, dynamic When Hitler charisma. was... Yeah. Hitler was... Yeah. Uh, but he, he, to look at him, he didn't look He's like anything. Just a, a little average. No, little, but little he crowd must. Crowd like me, you know. So. <laughs> well, well, actually, yeah, he's a, just a, just a person, you know. He wasn't he wasn't tall and great looking and and uh, oh, he, I guess he wasn't exactly ugly, but he was just an ordinary ordinary looking person, ordinary size. He wasn't very big. And he just, uh, so how could, he but he must have had a dynamic personality face to face, you know. Well, some people do, they just kind of carry everybody along with them. But to that extent, I don't know. I always, I used to, I'd see the pictures of him, you know, and I'd say, how can one man have that kind of power? And the movies that they make, uh, uh, you know, and they show, they're afraid to tell. Oh, I remember in The Longest Day, when that, that German general wants to have the tanks sent forward, and they they can't wake Hitler, he's asleep, they can't wake him up, and they lose the battle because they, they can't wake Hitler. I thought that, but that's the way it was, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. But, yeah. but I thought, no, that's ridiculous. That guy can't get his tanks up there, and if the tanks had been there, well, it was D-Day, he could have beat them down before they could get all their tanks and things ashore. But they wouldn't. They couldn't wake Hitler and <laughs> have his permission. Thank goodness. And that, yeah, like that. And I guess that that was true. From what everything you heard, nobody could do anything without Hitler's permission. So he he had to go. <laughs> he just had to go. Yeah. And uh, he was hard enough to get him too, wasn't it? <laughs> it took quite a fight. But yeah, I don't think what you were saying about those guys that came back and felt ashamed. They shouldn't feel that way, I don't think. Well, people shouldn't make them feel that way, but they shouldn't let the people make them feel that way. They did their job, and the job was not on the front lines, so what? My job wasn't on the front lines, I'm proud of it. I've always been proud that I served. Uh, my whole family served, even our dog. Our dog was in the K-9 Corps. <laughs> <laughs> we had this big tough dog. He was uh, half German Shepherd and half Doberman. And that was the toughest, meanest dog. The neighbors used to tell Mama she should get rid of him. And she, she, they had to be a year old to go in the canine corps. So Mama said, no, he's just not a family pet. When she kept him in a fenced yard, you know. But, uh, but oh, he was a mean dog. He was even mean to the family. <laughs> so my brother was only one that could, John, the one that lived at home. He was the only one who could really manage that dog. But Mama told the neighbor, no, he's, he's just not a family pet, but he'll do a good job. She said he's going to go in the canine corps. And she kept him. And then when John went, he still had a month before he'd be a year old and they'd take him. So she actually paid board for him. She put him in a kennel and paid board for him for a whole month, which she could ill afford. But but she was going to give him his chance. And he he served. He went in the K-9 Corps, and oh, they rated him top dog, you know. <laughs> and she used to get letters from his trainer. They assigned him to one person so they could work together with that one person. And his trainer wrote her letters, and... And when she got a kick out of, he sent her a little flag, you know the flags they used to put in the window with the stars on? She had one with three stars and then underneath the little dog one with one star on it. <laughs> and people would tell her, oh, you've got four sons in. And she says, no, no, one of them's a daughter and one's a dog. <laughs> and the, her, uh, the trainer sent her a letter and he says he's a credit to his country. <laughs> she oh, got a wow. kick out of that. He was a, he was a guard duty at uh, where was it Alamogordo, New Mexico, where they tested the A bomb, and he was on guard duty there. Wow. <laughs> and then after the war, they sent a letter. They said if you wanted the dog back, and if not, they would just you know. 
and we looked at each other. We said, they, they, oh, they said they would try to train them back like they were, and we looked at each other, oh, God forbid, <laughs> they trained him back like he was. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think they could anyway. They were so trained. But then they they'd sell them for guard dogs and like that. What they were trained to do. So and my brother by that time was married and had a little baby, so <laughs> he couldn't take the dog like that dog with a little kid. And by that time, it, well, you know, it was a, even tougher. <laughs> We'd been trained. <laughs> but that was funny. That I still I used to have a picture of that window. I thought it was so cute with a little dog flag on it. It's the only only one I ever saw. <laughs> Mama was like that. She she did everything. If it wasn't for her, I wouldn't have made it. I couldn't go and leave them. You know, they didn't have enough. My dad was just he worked all the time, but he was an alcoholic, and he just they needed the money. And then my brother was going, so it was just me. But but she went and did that. She hadn't worked in thirty years, and she she was riding. She oh people, people are so awful. She had a ride. She didn't drive. She didn't have a car. She had to ride with some guy, and she had to walk about two miles down to La Brea Avenue where he came through. He wouldn't pick her up at their house. There was gas rationing, but, but he got extra gas for having a passenger, but he wouldn't pick her up. She had to walk down there, and after working 10 hours on her feet, she had to walk home two miles. And that guy, everybody knew when her son went down, missing in action. And one day they were, going, they were driving to work, and he had the gall to say to her, I wish the war would last another year so I could get my house paid for and and she, I said, what did you say to him? He said, oh, I didn't say anything to him. She says, I just never rode with him again. <laughs> she just went on to work, and then she wouldn't even ride home with him. She got a ride with somebody. Huh. And every every day she'd walk come home. She wasn't a Catholic, but she'd come past a Catholic church on her way home, and she'd go in and light three candles for her kids. <laughs> I'm going to weep again. <laughs> she did that every day on her way home. She'd go in and light three candles wow. for her babies. We all came back, so I, <laughs> I guess it worked. Uh, she yeah, sounds like quite a woman. She was yes. a dear soul. <laughs> Not many mothers would do the things she did. In the first place, they wouldn't have let me go to war. <laughs> But she knew I wanted to so bad. Of course, she didn't want me to, but but she wouldn't stand in my way. She was a dear. Well, I think I've about told you all my stories. I don't well, know. I probably much. think of some more. Have you got any questions? No, that I you just <laughs> wonderful to talk with you. Oh, well, thank you. You know, it's a pleasure to have someone really interested. My kids are all heard my stories. They're bored stiff. <laughs> you know, they're not, though. And I've heard a lot of veterans say that. And, and talking to yeah. your daughter, Lisa, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, talking to Lisa, no. Oh, she, were you the one she talked to? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, she's yeah, she's quite a gal. And, and you know, they, they are much more... Sure, there's a certain point where... You know, like anything, if you hear it over and over again, eventually there's a part that we say, okay, well, the, we've heard it, but but yet to know it and to know what it was and to understand it. Well, they're all proud of me. They're all coming to the ceremony with me. Uh, I'm supposed to be the governor's date. <laughs> oh, I'm supposed to sit, I have to sit with the governor through the whole ceremony. And Lisa said you had to behave. Oh, I have to behave, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they they like to tease me, but they're all coming. These two are coming, and Lisa and, and her husband, and my two grandsons over on the coast, and I have a son in Florida. He's a weather forecaster down there, and I didn't think he could make it because he had already put in for leave in June before this came up, and he tried to change it, but somebody had already taken that week, so he couldn't. Then they wouldn't trade. They, they have 